Well, brethren, this is the Feast of Pentecost, a time of the first fruits of God's plan of salvation, a time that really, when we break it all down, pictures God cultivating his first fruits in preparation for a greater harvest that is pictured by the fall holy days. But here at this point in the mid season, if you will, between the holy days, between the spring holy days and the fall holy days, we have Pentecost. These days picture to us a reality of what God is doing, and that is that he is sowing the seed of the kingdom now, in this age prior to the return of Jesus Christ. That, that seed, the seed of the kingdom, takes root and it grows and it produces fruit among those who are called the first fruits. God plants his first fruits, a few at a time, as he sows for his kingdom. You see, God sees far into the future with a vision that transcends anything that we can have on the human level. Isaiah chapter 46 tells us that God declares, he says, I declare the end from the beginning and from the ancient times things that are not yet done. He says, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. It's Isaiah 46 verses 8 to 10. He declares the end from the beginning. Just like he said in Revelation 1, when, when Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He knows exactly what is going to be done, how it all is all to work out. He has that vision to be doing it. And we are in a very critical part of that right now that, in a sense, is really the, the time of the church. This is the, t the age of the church, the first fruits that are being sown for that, that coming kingdom. And God's doing it with an incredible vision. A number of years ago, I ran across a story that I think helps us to appreciate this a little bit. It's a, it's a story of vision on the human level. Human beings are able to do uh, significant things and with, with visionary actions. I was reading about a book, it was one of the books on leadership that I'd collected over the years, but they had an interesting story because the point that the author was making was about vision. And he told the story about Oxford and Cambridge colleges in England, the prestigious universities that England has had, uh, going back to the 14th century. Oxford and Cambridge have been around for a very, very long time. And in the late 14th century, when they built the first buildings, the faculty and the students began to move in. And it was originally, the original set was a quadrangle, a set of four buildings. And one of them was what is called the Great Hall. Uh, of assemblies and, and teaching and uh, gatherings, the great hall. And it was a huge hall done as only the English can do it with the great beams in the ceilings, the oak beams that held up the, the roof. And it, it was a grand, and is, a grand structure, still there. But as the years go up by with any building made with materials out of the earth, rot, decay, wear, deterioration sets in, and things have to be replaced, renovated. 500 years after the opening of the, these colleges, in the middle of the 19th century, the middle of the 1800s, 500 years later, the beams were rotting and they had to have some work done to them. And so they hired an architect, the college did, a man by the name of Sir Gilbert Scott, to restore the roof in the hall. You've got to have a, a roof over your building. Everything was badly rotted. So the architect, along with representatives from the college, visited a place, a great set of trees and woods that were called the Great Hall Woods in Berkshire. And there, they expected to find the trees that would provide the replacement beams. And sure enough, the trees were there. Because those trees had been planted 100 years earlier by visionary men who knew that the beams of the Great Hall would have to be replaced with oak. And so they cut down these hundred-year-old trees to replace the beams in the Great Hall. That was something planned only a hundred years in advance. But it illustrates the planning, the visionary planning that can go on, even at the human scale, how much greater the visionary planning that God is doing right now as he plants the seeds for his kingdom in those who are called the first fruits. 
It's a good story to help us focus on this day of the visionary planning that God has on a grander scale than that which replaces even a great hall in a great nation such as Great Britain. God is involved in the human scale of everyday events when it comes right down to your life and to mine. In his vision for each of us, he knows the end from the beginning. And this day, the day of Pentecost, summons us to consider that calling that he has given to us. And so I ask you all, brethren, here this morning, more with an exclamation mark than a question mark at the end, do you see your calling? Do you see your calling? We're being put together into a spiritual temple at Christ's return. We are part of that first fruits of God's plan. Let's turn over to James chapter 1 and be reminded of, of that in this one scripture here that is well known to us, James chapter 1. At verse 18, James says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of God that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. By his will. We have been brought forth by the word of truth to be the first fruits of God's creation. And the first fruits are something that we know from all of the imagery of the Old Testament uh, that fits this day of a wave sheaf offering that was given 50 days ago on that morning after Christ's resurrection. Uh, in the temple, Christ fulfilled that wave sheaf offering and the count began toward Pentecost. And here we are on that day assembled before God not necessarily with just that symbol to, to teach us, but with the, the symbol of not only first fruits, but also the, the vision of God's calling to us at this particular point in time and the planting that he is doing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, the Apostle Paul carries this imagery of a planting into uh, his description of the church begins in verse 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 5, where he talks about the work of, that he did in the city of Corinth to, to, with the church and that of Apollos and others. He said, we, we are those uh, through whom you believed, in verse 5, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. It is God that always gives the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. And when we put it all together, it is God who is doing the sowing and the planting. And he works through his instruments. He works through a ministry. He works through his church. He works through his, the individual members. But it is God who is, the, is sowing the seeds of the kingdom today, and he is the one who gives the, the increase. He says in verse 9, we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field. You are God's building. So Paul draws together the sowing and the field into this concept of a building that is being put together one piece at a time through the ages. And God knows the exact shape and form that each of us has a part to, fu to fulfill. And we are being shaped and crafted and molded by the experiences of our life today. All the good and even the unfortunate to shape us into God's building by a master craftsman beyond anything that we can ima imagine. Paul says in verse 10, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it, but each, let each one, of, each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. And that happens. It happens with the individual experiences of your life and mine, the successes we have, the setbacks we experience. It happens with, with each critical announcement that comes of uh, an injury, a sickness, an illness, a tragedy that might hit. It is all being done by God's purpose and God's will. In verse 16, he sums it up here. He says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? That's the ultimate building that God's concerned with, a, a temple, a spiritual temple being built by him, that God's Spirit 
the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And so I, again, I, I ask, do you see your calling? I have three big points that I want to make today. I could say I just have three points that I want to, but I got three big points to make today. It, it's a holy day. It's double Sabbath, so we got to have big points, huge points. Point number one, God has planted us in the body of Christ. God has planted us in the body of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, Paul says this, We then as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time, accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The Revised Standard Version really puts this in a, in a more accurate translation that it is a day of salvation. This is a day of salvation. God's plan teaches us that this is a day for the first fruits. There's, a large, there's another day coming for all of mankind. And God's timing, planning, and order according to the holy days plan that, that, that is outlined to us by the holy days. But this is our time. This is the time of the first fruits. This is our age, that of the church. And this is something that applies to us today. God has planted us in the body of Christ, and he is preparing us. This is our time. Our time is now. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul gives us here in this uh, letter to the, the uh, church at Corinth some very um, insightful understanding regarding the calling that we have. We sing this particular passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse six, 26. Paul writes, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise men according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Uh, we, we've all missed the boat on that. Our nobility is uh, of a different sort. Uh, we are going to be kings and priests in the future, but not having that today. And uh, there are hopes and dreams, and we might wish ourselves to be princesses or princes or kings, but God has his timing for that. But uh, this is our calling. But verse 26, he says, it is a calling. And he challenges again through these words to see our calling. Verse 27, he says, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. In these two verses, our calling is there. Paul says, see your calling. God has chosen. And that's exactly what's happened to each of us. God has designed, in, through his plan, a time. And in that time, in our period of, of this generation, this calling has taken place for you and for, for I, for others, my, my mother and your family members and friends and whatever connection that has brought you into the church that uh, brings you here today and your faith. Uh, this is a time and this is by God's choosing and this is a calling. And this is what God is doing as he has always done. You see, God prepared a Joseph long in advance of a particular need in Egypt that not only saved the Egyptians, but his own family. God prepared Joseph decades in advance for that particular moment and that particular event, and he, he, he saw it himself when he said to his brothers, you thought it for ill to me. But God was involved in this episode, in this affair, and God was. God prepared a David. He said to Jeremiah, I knew you in the womb. He provided parents for Jesus Christ to be born into the physical family. He provided a Pharisee named Saul to become an apostle. All men, all women prepared for positions in the work of God. And he is now preparing us for the future. In John chapter 14, he said that this was, is what he would be doing upon his resurrection and his ascension. What he told his disciples in that last meal with them, John chapter 14. Be 
beginning in verse 2. He said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And again, there are some very uh, nice songs and concepts that, that, that people have. I had an aunt that just recently died. Uh, I think she was 92, and um, my, my favorite aunt. And her, her son, one of my, my cousins, texted me and told me about her, de her death. And, and uh, you know, he, he talked about, you know, in, in his text that, you know, she, she's in her room in the mansion now. And that's, that comforts him. It's not a true, it's not truth. I didn't even try to engage him on it, but that, that comforted him. But the reality is that Christ is preparing mansions, as he says, and he's doing it right now. And he's doing it in the lives of first fruits, people who are going to be a part of that temple, fitly framed together into what is going to be put together. And it's all being done by design and by plan. And God is involved in working that. In verse 3, he says, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And so that is a part of the, the message of the, the day as well. That even now, Christ is preparing with the Father, the mansions, the places, the positions, the responsibilities in that temple, a spiritual temple that is being put together. And so again, it brings us back to, to what I, I have as my theme today. Do we see our calling? Do we really see with the spiritual perception that what we are involved with today in the church, in our lives, in our daily activities, and in this calling is a process of training and preparation by the living Christ, through the spiritual community that is called the church. And I say church with a big C, not j just a little C, the big C church, for the job in the age to come, because the church is the body of Christ. And the purpose of our life today is that. That's why God has called us. That's why we assemble on Pentecost, and that is what should be in, in our mind, that God has called us with a holy calling now to his church. And our unity and our purpose must be with, within that and understanding why exactly we are called now rather than later. Perhaps for so many members through the years, as the years and turn into decades, turn into a lifetime of faith in the church, the question always comes back, why me, why now? Is it worth it? And yes, it is worth it. And we work with, through that faith to, to always stand firm and, and strong in that, recognizing, but the, the ultimate key comes back to the realizing that why now rather than later? We might fantasize that it would be easier later. I'm not quite so sure about that, but God knows what he's doing, that he has called his first fruits now. But we have to keep that vision in, in our mind because it is the vision of God. And, only, and as long as the church can do that, it fits into its purpose and mission and its work to take the gospel to the world and to care for those disciples that are called. As long as the church keeps that vision in mind, we can grow. We will be able to withstand any attacks that come either from within or without. And the key to understanding that is what helps us to get through the challenges of our life. Let's turn back to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter, two, uh, chapter 4. I'm sorry, it's 1 Peter chapter 4. There is no 2 Peter 4. But you already found that out. Beginning in verse 12. 2 Peter 4 beginning in verse 12. Beloved, he says, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Rather, there are tr fiery trials that are a part of this life. President Kubik wrote a letter this, uh, on Friday that was sent out to us, listing some of the trials, immediate trials, facing some of our families and brethren within the church. As I said, when those notices, those emails come in, our heart takes a leap and we, we think, oh no, and we pray and we beseech God and we wonder why, why so young? We wonder why even with those who've lived a full life, 
But a verse like this is something we have to always come back to and understand. That those matters are a part of life. And as you said, don't think it's strange concerning the trial, the fiery trial, which is to try you as though something strange thing happened to you. It happens to everyone. It happens to us, even the first fruits. Rejoice, he says, to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, and when his glory is revealed, you will also be glad with exceeding joy. Verse 15, let's read verse 16. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Just as we are first fruits of God's plan in this age, this verse fits us too, that judgment, our time of judgment, uh, is what he's talking about here. This period of judgment has come upon us as it begins at the house of God, the people of God. Uh, we are being judged by the things written in the books of the Bible through our life and our example and our adherence to that. And it is that knowledge that brings us here on the day of Pentecost and will bring us back on trumpets and to the feast and to the Passover uh, next year. It is that knowledge which unfolds the, the purpose and the plan of God and, and salvation. And it is that knowledge of God and his perfect wisdom and, yes, judgment that is the ultimate key to help each one of us put the trial, the sickness, the tragedy into the proper context to even begin to understand it. And in time, and by God's grace, and by his, his spirit, we will, and we do understand it. But it has to be put within that context. That's what, what Peter is saying. Don't think it's strange. It hurts. It's painful. And we'll question God. As I sometimes tell people, go ahead and if you want, yell a little bit at God as you work yourself in faith through to an understanding and to an answer. But never turn your back on God. Never leave God, because he will not leave us. So when we come to the day of Pentecost, we have an understanding that, that God has planted us in his church. And we have to keep that in mind as we deal with these situations. Big point number two. God has planted us into each other's lives. He's planted you into the life of the person sitting next to you or across from you or in another part of the room. He's planted you in their life. He's planted you in my life. He's planted me in your life. God not only has planted us into the body of Christ, but he has planted us into each other's lives. It's called relationships. And that's where it gets kind of rough sometimes. Because we are to care for one another. We've embedded that into our mission in the United Church of God. We are to care for the disciples that God adds. That's a part, part of it all. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I've had reason to think about this verse in recent days and looking at uh, so, so many different situations that I've encountered and been working with and been aware of. First Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 18 in this passage, it talks about the body. It says, but now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. We've all been placed in the, bat, in the body. We've been planted in that body. As God pleases, the timing is his, pleases him, the when pleases him, the where, and the how. And if they were all one body, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And he goes on to talk about how they interact uh, with one, one another. And then it, it says down at the middle of verse 24, but God composed the body having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. 
And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. We all rejoice together and we all suffer together. And if there's not a time with all the social media available to us together, uh, to, uh, to, uh, available to us today, that we cannot see the understanding of that verse as we suffer together and track one another, um, it is. But Paul writes this matter about us all suffering together. If one suffers, we all suffer. In the midst, in the context of what he says in verse 25, that there be no schism in the body. There is no schism, no division. Christ is not divided. Uh, that, that's another question that Paul has already asked and answered in chapter 1. There is no division. Christ is not divided. Several weeks ago, I received word that a good friend of mine had developed serious disease called Lou Gehrig's disease. My good friend's name was Todd Carey. Some of you knew Todd Carey. Todd Carey and I worked together in the ministry. I trained him. We came to a parting of the ways a few years ago in a schism. But then somebody came to my door in my office and said with the news that he's got Lou Gehrig's. And so I tried to call him with the numbers that I had. I hadn't talked to him in about seven years. And couldn't get him with the numbers that I had. And I finally said to one of the other members of the office and the staff, and I said, do what you can, find me his number. Came back a few minutes later with the number. So I finally got hold of him. And we had a good talk. We talked for about an hour. And it was just like old times. We talked about his illness. We talked about faith. We talked about family. We talked about God. We talked about what each other meant, what we meant to each other, because we had been through the wars. And it was good. I thought that I might get a chance to see him, but a few weeks ago, uh, he died in his sleep, and mercifully, with that disease, didn't linger. But I was glad that I made the effort to talk to him. He was glad. And we had a good talk. We didn't talk about the things that had divided us. We talked about the things that had united us and the memories. And it was a good note to end on. And it'll be a good note to pick up on sometime in the future and to continue the conversation. When all of our empires of dirt crumble, under the return of Jesus Christ and when God sorts it all out. He and I were planted in each other's lives. You're planted in people's lives. And brethren, we have to take very, very good care to nurture our relationships. We have to nurture our relationships that we have been given because things can go bad. They can go south real quick. This week we... Um, we had our grandkids with us in our annual <clears throat> Camp kick -a -tail. <laughs> For those of you that don't know what Camp kick -a -tail is, in the McNeely family, 35 or more years ago, my two sons were lollygagging around the house on summer vacation, and they needed something to do. They, they needed their tails kicked. Uh, so we instituted what we call Camp kick -a -tail in the McNeely household, which was whatever had to be done that day. Uh, pulling dandelions out of the front yard, sometimes it was make work, and uh, you know, it just go to the library to get books to read or whatever, but we called it Camp kick -a -tail, and that faded as they, 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 they uh, grew older. Now we have grandkids, so a few years ago, Debbie and I decided to reinstitute Camp kick -a -tail with our grandkids. So we get our grandkids for several days in the summer, and we do, what, we do Camp kick -a -tail. My son Ryan says it really doesn't resemble anything that he <laughs> remembers about <laughs> Camp kick -a -tail in his day. In fact, he's, he's renamed it Camp Relax-A-Lot. <laughs> and so we, 
whatever you want to put a name on it, we, we had that this week. So here's my, uh, I, there's, a, there's a point to this. <laughs> we decided the other night, let's watch a movie. And we have all the, we, we, have, we have movies in the cloud, we have movies on DVD, and we have the prehistoric movies still on VHS. So we, we had a, a v, an old VHS movie that we pulled out called A Secret Garden. Oh yeah, you know that one, right? The Hallmark Channel version, we had bought that years ago, and the kids kind of, what? They don't, I, you know, they wanted to watch Star Wars. I couldn't get Star Wars for them, and uh, so we said, well, let's, let's watch The Secret Garden. Your daddy watched The Secret Garden, and he liked it. <laughs> so, okay, finally, Grandma, Grandpa, go ahead and put it on. So we, we tied them into their chairs so that we could watch The Secret Garden. <laughs> and you know what? They got into the story. And we got into it because we, we didn't know this and forgot about it. The movie was filmed at Carnarvon Castle, that Downton Abbey. Yeah. <laughs> and that instantly picked up even my wife. She, she got back into that one. And she already knew that at the, the last scene, the cl climactic scene, the hero that walks into the secret garden was none other than Mr. Darcy otherwise known as Colin Firth, in the definitive version of Pride and Prejudice, for those of you that are in, into, into that. So it was a good night for all of us, and, we, and the kids watched The Secret Garden. But there's one line from The Secret Garden that we've always remembered. In fact, Debbie stitched it into a little plaque and piece that is hanging on one of our, the walls of our home now all these years. And the line is this, where you tend a rose, a thistle, cannot grow. Where you tend a rose, a thistle cannot grow. It's a classic line out, right out of the book, and they put it into the movie, which tells us that we have to, to, we have to not only tend a rose and a garden to keep the, the thistles and the weeds from growing in and choking out the fruit, the life. You know, you've got your gardens in already, gentlemen, for the, for the summer, and it looks pretty good right now but you know those weeds are gonna come on and the, the, the garden has to be tended. Relationships have to be tended. Our thistles grow up, thorns take over and choke out the life, the vitality, the love of those relationships. God has planted us into each other's lives. And brethren, we have to tend and nurture those relationships and not let anything come between them, between us. We are building a, a spiritual community. This is our calling as well. When Christ said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another, that's exactly what he was speaking to. We will grow together in the bonds of love and fellowship as we recognize that we are all disciples. We must come to, at some point, really truly learn to understand one another and to love one another and to turn to each other at times and turn our faces and open our hearts to God and let that spirit create that, that attitude of love within us. It will be done. It is being done. We have to be in the flow of God's spirit working that within us. Big point number three. Because God has planted us in his church and because he has planted each other into our lives, we have to prepare to reign with Jesus Christ. We have to prepare to reign with him. We have to gird up our loins to advance the work of the kingdom in our lives today. The seeds of the kingdom have been sown into our lives as first fruits and we have got to uh, advance that work. We are in a spiritual war. I love Ephesians chapter 5 on this. Ephesians chapter 5. I was going to turn to Ephesians chapter 6, but my son spoke on that yesterday. So he's helped me to shorten the sermon here today. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 14. It's one of my favorite scriptures to, to turn to to kind of get a jolt. Ephesians 5, 14, therefore he says, Awake, you who sleep, 
Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. We have to wake up. We have to be alert. We have to live our lives fully alert and aware of ourselves, of the times, and of the spiritual forces that are arrayed against the group of people called the first fruits. There are deep, powerful spiritual forces aimed at the first fruits and always have been. This is the group that Satan hates and fears the most. They are the group that will replace his rule on the earth, the first fruits who are being prepared today. That's what we're all about, really. That's our vision. That's our message. We're being prepared to reign with Jesus Christ. And each day, and each year, each season of our life, each episode that we go through that tries our and just wrenches our heart with emotion, either in our own families or for another family in the church of God through sickness or death or tragedy, it just is an opportunity to clear out some of the clutter of our lives and to get focused upon what's really important, to clear out the clutter of our church, our church life at times that, that, just, that allows us to get divided, to get a laser focus on the scriptures that define this day and define our calling. The Feast of Pentecost is about the first fruits of God and the Lamb. The Feast of Pentecost is about the church of God. It's about the body of Christ. It's about a day of salvation for the first fruits. This day is about you. This day shows us that this is our time. Your time is now. It has to stir us then with a vision of how God is working in our lives. And stir us even with a vision as to how God would solve the problems, the intractable and unsolvable problems of the greater world around us. We live a relatively sheltered life at times, and yes, reality intrudes in when sickness and tragedy strikes. But as we, my son was saying yesterday in his sermon, we, how do we react as Christians? As we kind of keep one eye looking at the, the, the world we live in and uh, keep from get, being so fearful of the larger picture of the world, truly there's enough in, in our own personal lives to be concerned about, but we are, we are surrounded by that on, on a regular uh, basis. Again, it's the calling, the, the vision of this calling that God is involved in our lives, and he knows why he's called us, and he knows the, the, the role that we are to play, and so that the individual events of, of this life that happened to us are there as a part of that greater purpose. And when we submit in faith to God in that way, we will come to an understanding, even if the answer in the moment is not what we want or wish or have a trouble bearing up under. We have to keep a vision of what God is doing. We're in an interesting period in our world right now. There's a greater storm yet to break upon this world. At times we, we look and we see the black clouds that, are, that gather on the horizon. But we have to have a vision that God has called us to learn a way of life and to make sure that it works in our lives so that the fruits are manifest not only for us to taste and to enjoy, but for others to see that something works. Some people have faith. Some people know where they're going and why they're doing what they're doing. And some people know that there is a God, even as the world continues to roll in a direction opposite of where God is. We have to have the vision to see ourselves as a leader, a ruler, a king, a priest in that coming kingdom. In Revelation chapter 19, a statement is made. <clears throat> for us all to consider. Revelation chapter 19, well-known verse that pictures the the marriage of Christ to the church, Revelation 19, verse 7. It says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. The Lamb is Christ, the wife is the church. Let us rejoice because the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Every time I read that verse, I, I'm struck by the, the tense of the verse. 
that the, the church, the wife, has made herself ready. When it comes to that moment of the marriage, she's ready. She's ready. Which means that there's a time of preparation that precedes that, and that time is now for you and I. In other words, Christ is preparing the bride right now. So that when it comes to that moment that verse 7 talks about, she's ready. That's a staggering thought. Because the way I bring it down to my own life, I say basically, and here's my, my take on it, I'm either a part of that preparation or I'm not. Am I being prepared or not? In or out? One way or the other. There's no, there's no in-between on this. When that moment of marriage comes, the church is ready, which means right now it's being prepared in our time. That is also a very important thought for you and I to remember on the day of Pentecost, because it is being done today. Are we a part of the process or otherwise? That's a question that we, we all have to ask ourselves, because when that day comes, then what is said in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, where in the days of the kings that are mentioned in that prophecy of Daniel 2, it says the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all those kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Daniel 2 verse 44 points to what this day pictures as well. Because when Christ sets up that kingdom described here, that kingdom, it says, will not be left to other people. In other words, it will be given to the saints, the first fruits, those who are part of the church, the body of Christ that have been prepared, those that have been planted, and those who have been planted not only in the body of Christ, but have been planted in each other's lives. And I've understood that and never forgotten it. The church is a spiritual community called and chosen by God, called to learn today. We used to use the phrase, it was coined a number of years ago, that the church was a teacher's college. That's still an appropriate phrase to remember, a teacher's college. It's a place of preparation for the world to come. A group of people prepared in advance for a job that is going to be inaugurated when Christ returns. And that's what this day pictures, a time of the first fruits of God's plan, a time picturing God cultivating those first fruits as preparation for the larger, greater harvest pictured by all of these holy days. Visionary men planted oak trees in a forest in England a hundred years before they were needed. Remarkable lesson from that. God today is sowing the seeds of the kingdom with an ever greater vision that has been going on for much, much longer. And that seed has taken root, and it's growing, and it's producing fruit among those that are called the first fruits. God plants. He's sowing for the, his kingdom. God sees far into the future for his plan. Brethren, do you see your calling.